All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we are going to talk about five things that I wish I had actually had someone tell me before I started brewing. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome. Thank you for checking out this video and thank you for checking out my channel. Here on my channel, I'll typically either do a grain to glass video or I'll do a shorter video like this one on various topics in home brewing. If you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button and hit that like button as well so you get to see more content like this recommended to you. I've been brewing for over five years now as of making this video and I've learned a lot during that period of time. However, there are some things that if somebody had just told me early on in my brewing career and I'd listened to them, then I probably would have started making better beer faster. And I'm going to share five of those things with you today. The first thing is that maltsters matter. Maltsters are the term for the companies that make malt. There's tons and tons of different maltsters out there. Uh, some of the big names out there are like Weyermann, Brees, Thomas Fawcett, those are just to name a few. However, there's a lot of smaller and more localized maltsters as well. And more often than not, if you can work with them, you should. Their malts are going to be of a higher quality and much, much fresher than the big maltsters. Picking a specific maltster for a specific kind of beer is not something I really learned until like maybe two or three years into my brewing process. It's something that started to make a difference once I started to pick continental ingredients for different types of beer styles. So. In short, you know, if I'm brewing a German beer, I definitely want to pick a German maltster. Weyermann is probably a good example of that. Or if I want to brew a Belgian beer, I probably want to get Belgian malts it's because that's authentic. So I get malts from something like Dingemann's or Chateau if I'm using Belgian malts. Long story short, if I want to use a Pilsner malt from Weyermann, it's going to be different than a Pilsner malt from Brees, and it's going to be different from Pilsner malt from Chateau. But even within those maltsters, you may also have different kind of uh, quality levels, if you will, of the same kind of malt. So Weyermann's actually a great example. You have your basic Weyermann Pilsner malt, for example, which is just your standard Pilsner malt. There's no frills about it. It is Pilsner malt, and it will make it pretty good Pilsner. It's high quality malt, actually. So there's also Weyermann Bohemian Pilsner malt, which is actually using a different kind of barley entirely than the regular Pilsner malt. It actually makes a huge difference in the final beer overall. Then you step one level up and you have things like Weyermann Floor Malted Bohemian Pilsner Malt, and that is made in the traditional way, which again changes how that malt actually ends up coming across. And then you have something like the Weyermann Bark Pilsner Malt, which is the high quality Pilsner, it's their premium Pilsner in a way. Uh, and that again changes the final beer in probably a positive way. If it's not apparent, I really love using Weyermann malts because it's the easiest German maltster to get a hold of and I love making German beers. That's the examples from one maltster alone. Imagine what happens when you have three or four different maltsters to choose from and each of these maltsters uses a different farmer's barley crop and is making malt in a slightly different way. There's a lot of variation that goes into it, and at the end of the day, if you do your research and you end up brewing the same beer with a whole bunch of different maltsters' malts, that way you can kind of narrow down exactly what kind of flavor you want out of your beer, and you can leverage the best maltster for that particular character of your beer uh, to your advantage. So the bottom line for that is, next time you walk into your home brew shop looking for Pilsner malt, why don't you ask the owner where he got it from? Number two is uh, something that honestly that probably should be the most important thing in this entire list. Um, and that is that the importance of fermentation temperature control cannot be understated. The one single thing you can do in your brewing to improve your beer quality leaps and bounds is to control your fermentation temperature. One more time, fermentation temperature control is the most important thing you can do in brewing. Once again, this is something that I kind of was like, meh, it's like malt, you know, it's like not really that important, I guess, it's all the same. You know, 68, gonna be a little bit different than 75. Mm, I can do 75 if I want to. It's my room temperature, what, what, you know, what could hurt? Yeah. Depending on the strain and the type of beer you're brewing, yeast are incredibly sensitive to fermentation temperature. And oftentimes, the temperature inside of your fermentation vessel is going to be two or three degrees higher than the ambient temperature measured on the outside of the fermenter. Before I actually deliberately controlled the temperature of my fermentations, oftentimes I was just kind of like sitting it in the room and like trying to brew a beer that kind of made sense for the room temperature I was working with. So I'd brew like, you know, Belgian ales or wheat beers or something like that in the summer and work with English ales or IPAs or American beers and stuff like that in the winter. 
And that, that's actually a reasonably good method of doing it. However, you have to really pay attention to the actual temperature. Because when your apartment fluctuates from 65 degrees to 75 degrees throughout the course of a day, say it's the middle of the summer and you don't run your air conditioning all the time, at that point you're really going to have to look into a different setup for fermentation temperature control. The beers that I was making after I started controlling the fermentation temperature were 10 times better than the ones that I was making beforehand. If you happen to have a room where you can control the actual air temperature and actually tightly control it, then that's a good method if you don't have too much space and if you can actually reliably control the room's temperature and I would advise keeping it three to five degrees cooler than your intended fermentation temperature because of that extra temperature inside your fermentation vessel. Another method is to get a small chest freezer hooked up to a simple temperature controller uh, and to use that as a fermentation chamber. That's probably gonna be your best bang for your buck. Uh, it may take up a little bit of space, but ultimately it's gonna allow you to really control that temperature quite well um, and gives you a space to keep all your fermenters as well out of the way. The last method is a dedicated temperature control system, which usually involves some kind of cooler or heating pad that is actually integrated into the fermenter. On the low end, you have something like the Anvil Bucket Fermenter, which I do actually really use a lot and enjoy. Um, they have a really cost-effective temperature control system that actually works really well just with a simple bucket of water in a dorm fridge um, that is, you know, working at about, you know, 45 degrees. That can actually get as low as 45 degrees in the fermenter and maintain that temperature. It's much more reliable when you're fermenting ales that need to go a little bit lower than room temperatures. So something like an English ale. Um, and it's a very affordable system. I will link it down below in the description box if you're interested. And of course, there's the high end of things where you have a glycol chiller. And well, that is ultimately the best way to do it. But it just costs an absolute ridiculous amount of money. And it's up to you as to how much money you want to dump into this hobby. The third thing I wish somebody had told me early on was that you need to get the basics of every type of beer down before you start making crazy recipes and designing really extravagant beers. An example that I use a lot is your classic overcomplicated pastry stout. So if you wanna make, I don't know, like a, a peanut butter, chocolate, Oreo, vanilla stout or something like that, which could be really good and probably sounds really good in your mind, you probably should figure out how to brew a basic stout first. And you probably wanna get pretty good at brewing stouts before you launch yourself into the realm of pastry stouts and adding different kinds of flavors to beer. Again, this is something I really wish somebody had told me because the second beer I ever brewed was a Russian Imperial Stout. It didn't work. Whether it's like a pastry stout or a bourbon oak aged stout or a uh, super complicated Belgian Saison or a sour beer that has like nine different layers of flavors added to it. Just make sure you get the basics of that particular style of beer down before you take that step and brew that super complicated beer. So that way you're probably much more likely to be successful when you actually go for it versus just kind of sending it and <laughs> seeing what happens. The fourth thing I wish somebody had told me was that all grain doesn't need to be a complicated thing. Uh, so I had this vision in my mind when I started brewing that there was extract and that there was all grain. And that extract is what people did when they started out and that all grain was what people did when they had like 50 brews under their belt and knew what they were doing. That's not necessarily true because you can actually start brewing, if it's your first bash, you can actually start brewing with all grain right now. You can skip the whole extract piece if you want to. Extract does not exist as an inferior method of brewing. Nothing could actually be further from the truth. It is more convenient of a method of brewing and it saves people time. And that's the whole reason it exists and that's the main reason why people tend to use it when they start out brewing because it's simpler to understand and it has fewer steps involved in all grain brewing. But what if I told you that you could get into all grain brewing for only a few more extra steps and only one or two very inexpensive pieces of equipment. And that is by using brew in a bag. When I made the leap to all grain, that is how I started doing it. And honestly, I was amazed at how simple it actually was. And I was expecting this thing to be much, much more complicated. I was expecting it to be a lot more variables. I was expecting to need a lot more equipment. But at the end of the day, all I needed was a bag. If you're familiar with partial mash or steeping grains, this is just gonna make complete sense. All you're doing is scaling up the steeping grain step to a full size batch. Typically the rule of thumb is that your kettle needs to be twice the size of your intended batch size. So you generally wanna do a 10 gallon size kettle for a five gallon size batch. Uh, and then beyond that, all you need is a bag that can hold your grains. Um, typically you want some type of porous or muslin bag. I'm gonna link one in the description down below if you wanna check that out. 
uh, but it needs to span the entire circumference of your brew kettle and be able to hold 10 to 15 pounds of grain depending on your batch size. Once that's set up and your brewing water is at the right temperature for a mash in, you just dough in with your grist and uh, you close the lid, cap it up, put some insulating material around the kettle and let it sit for an hour and you should be golden. From there on out, pull the bag out, let it drain and you have wort. And then just in the same exact vessel, fire it up to a boil and then continue as usual. You know the rest of the steps. It's actually really quite a simple concept and it's a very, very easy way to get into all grain and it will make just as good of beer as the folks working with their three vessel turnkey systems. The concept is so bulletproof that it is used nowadays in every single all-in-one brewing system that is out there. From the Anvil Foundry to the Clawhammer Supply System that I used all the way up to the Spike Solo, every single all-in-one system uses that exact same concept and it makes great beer. The last thing I wish people had told me when I started brewing was how to balance a beer. That is kind of one of the more difficult concepts to understand, especially as a new brewer, and it really comes down to balancing sweetness with bitterness. And understanding the different sources that you get sweetness and bitterness from. There's a lot of different factors at play that cause you to have a beer that is heavily weighted towards sweetness or heavily weighted towards bitterness. Most of the time you want a beer to be balanced. You, won't, you don't want it to be overly sweet because that can be just kind of gross and sickeningly sweet and you don't want it to be overly bitter because that can just be unpleasant. If you can get that perfect balance between sweetness and bitterness, that is one of the things that can take a beer from good to great. So you can get sweetness from a variety of different sources. The most common one, of course, is the malts. And if you have any sort of leftover unfermented sugars uh, or complex sugars, then you're gonna have a decent amount of residual sweetness in the beer. However, another way that sweetness makes its way into the beer is actually with alcohol content. The higher an ABV something is, the more kind of artificial sweetness your mind thinks uh, it's experiencing. And a good example of that is most liquors. Bourbon, for example, can actually feel very sweet when you think about it. You're able to kind of taste an artificial sweetness from the high alcohol content in those liquors. And the same thing is true in beer as well. The higher the alcohol content of the beer, then the higher the perceived sweetness will be in your mind. Bitterness, on the other hand, can come from a variety of sources as well. The usual suspects, of course, are hops, um, where we are intentionally adding bitterness to a beer using hops. However, you can also get bitterness out of the water profile. If you have a very high sulfate content in your water profile for the beer, it's gonna trick your mind into believing that it's actually drier and more bitter than it actually is. And of course, at the end of the day, if the beer is actually finishing very dry, like this Saison here, for example, then it's actually gonna be perceived in a much more bitter way than if it had a little bit more sweetness to kind of fight that bitterness. In some cases, like IPAs or in like pastry stouts, you're gonna want to have a heavy bias towards either bitterness or sweetness. However, in most beers, you're really gonna wanna find that balance and you're gonna strike that balance very, very carefully. And most times when I'm developing my recipes, the balance between bitterness and sweetness is one of the most critical elements of the entire recipe design. And I actually treat that very, very carefully. And at the end of the day, a balanced beer is usually going to be a better beer than one that is too sweet or too bitter. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I hope you learned something. If you did, please hit the like button. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you want to support the channel, please check out the merch store down below in the description box where you can get a t-shirt like this one here and many others like it. If you happen to be in the market for some home brewing equipment, please check out my Amazon store, which is in the description box, where every single product on that store I do personally vouch for and have used in the past. If you want to support the channel on a more personal basis, please check out the Patreon, which is in the description box as well. And thank you very much to my Patreon supporters, because you guys are doing some amazing things for this channel, and it is really paying off in dividends right now. Thank you guys for watching all the way to the end. You are my true fans if you made it this far, and I appreciate you. Anyway, I will catch you guys in the next video. So until then, cheers.